further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to him. Well, I'm going to start, and it's nice to see, it's nice to see um, friendly faces here, some, some neighbors, some friends from near, and some friends from far, and, uh, it, you know, it's not snowing. It's <laughs> here you are. We're not in Buffalo. People who believe in, in, people who believe in books and are, and are willing to drive through the leaves. And if it were snowing, <laughs> we, would, we wouldn't ask, you know, we wouldn't hold it against you if you hadn't come. But thank you so much for coming out. I feel very comfortable here in Maynard because I've done a couple of programs at this library and um, I ought to be able to find it in the dark better than I was able to tonight, but that's another story. Um, I, I proposed to my friend Bob Binstock, whom I've known for, for about 20 years, uh, that we, we read a little bit from our new novels and that we have a very casual conversation under the rubric, Writing Through Time. Now, this is one of those all-purpose titles that could, that could, for which anything we spoke from now on could be accurate, even if it's when you don't feel like writing, you're going to write later, how do you make that cassoulet? And then we could talk about you know, cooking recipes as a way to post all writing, because the writing was going to happen some other time. Uh, but there's, but there's, there's a more, uh, more interesting way. Is, is that too loud? Is that okay? No, good. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, there's a more interesting way to think about that title, writing through time, because all writers, when they pick up a pen or go to their computer, are actually channeling who they are and who they were onto who they will become when the book is done. And so, writing is always a, a transactional exercise. Uh, art is a transactional exercise that takes everything that you have and chooses from it in order to make something that will exist in time. But that too, that could be true of any two writers sitting here and talking about this. There is a slightly more specific reason that I chose writing through time, and that has to do with the specific literary histories of the development of each of our most recent projects. I'm going to talk about mine very quickly because actually Bob's, I think, is more interesting, but I just want to get mine out of, way, out of the way. So, um, after all, because I started. Um, Bob, is, Bob is the author of, of uh, two or three previous novels three. Tree, Tree of Heaven and The Soldier. And, and the story collection, which and the, perhaps 327 people know. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, they, then he did not publish anything for some time while, uh, while this book was in him. And he will talk about that. I have, a, I have a story about writing through time. That's not the story of how I became a writer, but it's a specific story about my new book, Egg and Spoon, which is a Russian fairy tale adventure, a, a fantasy, based on tropes of Russian fairy tales, like the Firebird and Baba Yaga, the witch with iron teeth who lives in a house that stands on chicken legs. Uh, and, and the reason this book seemed appropriate to me to talk about writing through time is that 31 years ago, I wrote another book about Baba Yaga. It was my fourth book. It was called The Dream Stealer. It was a very short fantasy novel, and it was the first novel I ever wrote that was set entirely in a magic situation. It wasn't a case of somebody walking into a wardrobe and then coming home or dropping into a rabbit hole and then climbing back up. The entire um, scene of the book was a magic universe. It was magic Russia. The, the story uh, had its little success, meaning very little success. <laughs> uh, it went out of print almost immediately. It was then brought back into print uh, in a different edition, which lasted in print even shorter. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I lived in England, uh, a friend of mine uh, and her husband helped me bring it out in a, in, a, in a press edition that's not unlike how Bob has brought out Swift River, that is the rights were mine, and we printed it and, so, and, we printed it and sold it online. Um, it has, and this was the third edition, which actually lasted longer than the first two. It didn't sell very much. It was just that they had more room in their basement. Uh, but still, those books were, there was something about that story that stayed with me for 31 years. And when I was asked by DreamWorks Animation out in Hollywood 
to come up with a film idea based on one of my earlier stories, I first took The Dream Stealer and thought, oh, this is an obvious film script. I can turn this into a film script you know, in three pages. I mean, somebody else can write it, but I can give them the points, the talking points, and you know, then it will have a new life. Well, I gave them the talking points, and they said, no, it doesn't work for us. We'll look at it again when it's a novel. I had not planned to write it as a novel. <laughs> and but you it, said, I'll show them. And then I said, then I said well, and the more, when, as I began to work on it as a novel, I thought, no, I am a different person than I was 31 years ago. I cannot write this book again. Either this book was good for them or it wasn't. But if I'm going to write about some of the same concerns that I had 31 years ago, I am still that, that writer. But I am older, I am more impatient and more patient, and I will do the job a different way now. And that's how, that's why I think Egg and Spoon is writing through time. It's a story that took at least 31 years to write, even if I didn't actually start it until last year. <laughs> and, and this is just me meant to be a somewhat amusing way to, to raise the subject of the evening. And, and right before I turn to Bob, the one other thing that I want to say is that uh, the same issue of, of taking a story and having it have bend through time can be considered in a lot of uh, different strategies of writing. Since I see that you have Wicked out on the, on the table, the truth is Wicked was published 25, or 20 years ago almost, mm -hmm. and it's the occasion of the publication of this book that I met Bob because we were reading together in, at a bookstore in Vermont. And then 15 years after Wicked, I wrote Out of Oz, which was the last of the four books. So that writing through time occurred too. It took me 15 years to write four novels in this sequence. Now, finally, I will, um, with, without having given my friend any advance notice, I will introduce you to a friend of mine who's visiting from England, who's sitting in the front row. Her name is Jill Peyton Walsh. She's a novelist. And she happens to be one of the publishers of The Dream Stealer. Uh, I, might not have, I might not have mentioned uh, Jill. I didn't, I didn't give her warning. In fact, I wasn't planning to. But I see that out on the table, they have a copy of Jill's latest book, which I didn't ask them to do, The Late Scholar. Now, The Late Scholar is based on characters by Dorothy Sayers, Lord Peter Whimsey and Harriet Bain, my friend Jill, was chosen by, by the Sarah's trustees, the trustees of her estate, to finish a manuscript that she had left unfinished at her death, and then they approved uh, the selection of Jill to write a couple more novels, one based on some ideas she had, and then finally a completely original novel. So even though I haven't asked Jill to come up and sit at the table, in fact, what Jill has done has been writing through time, not just through the time of her life as a writer, but through the time of somebody else's life as a writer. So I give you those analogies as a way to say that anybody you want to think about writing in the next 35 minutes is probably appropriate because we live in time, we read in time, and we carry all of ourselves to whatever project it is that we're about to launch on with expectation and dread. So speaking of dread, Bob is here too. <laughs> <laughs> well, he understands it's been a long, long time since I did this. So. Forgive any anxiety or awkwardness that shows through. Um, the, the topic, writing through time, is in fact perfect for this evening, which goes without saying because Gregory's a genius. But um, he's, he's just, he's told you so much already and he's just covered a small portion of the ways that you can apply that to all sorts of work. In my case, uh, let's see, Steve said several years and Gregory said some time. Those are kind of euphemistic. My last book was published in 1996. And I did write a, several more novels, but I, I, don't, I can't give you an exact date. Uh, I guess it was about 10 years ago I just gave up after years and years and years of rejection. And I really thought that would be it for the rest of my life. But, um, a chance encounter on the internet with someone who was very encouraging started me thinking maybe I would revise this book, which had been through many revisions back in the old days. And I started looking at it and thinking about what I would do to it. 
And I mentioned it to my wife, who's been extremely supportive about the possibility of my ever getting back. And she said, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a Kickstarter to raise some money and then we're gonna self-publish it. And I thought that was ridiculous. But in fact, it wasn't. <laughs> Kickstarter, any of you who's like considering any kind of creative project at all, let me tell you, the fact that people give you money and it can be $5, is so encouraging, it gives you such confidence. Words are one thing, but when people chip in, it makes you feel that they really want you to do it. And self-publishing is a wonderful thing. I'm really enjoying that. But, um, uh, so I have an instance of a book which has a main narrative spine that goes from 1927 to 1938. So that's a distance of time to write through. And um, then there's the time it took me <laughs> to write the book. And as Gregory said, of course, I'm very different than I was when I started it 20 years ago. I'm a very different person. I've learned a great deal. And then there's the fact that the main or the larger action of the book surrounding the character is something that through the lens of time is almost alien to us now. Uh, we're all aware that people that flooded towns where people lived to make reservoirs, but you know we would never do it now. Um, so that's another way of writing through time, which is examining something that time has left behind. But um, so. Why don't, you, why don't you tell them a little bit about what the book is about and maybe read the three epigrams at the beginning. Oh, okay. Well, I have, we're saving the epigrams for oh, later. Okay. But well, no, 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 no. no. This, is, this is cool. <laughs> this is great. Um, the book is about, the book is the story of a young woman growing up during the construction of the Quabbin Reservoir in Greenwich, Massachusetts, uh, which is something that took decades to develop. Um, I think the, the plan that what was called the Swift River Plan for solving Boston's constantly pressing water needs was first raised in the 80s, uh, possibly in the, or in the 1890s. Um, and uh, then it took a long time to do. And some people got out right away. Some people even got out before they passed the law enabling it. Some people stuck around for a while. Some people stuck around to the bitter end. Um, so, and. Polly goes from being 12 at the time, around 12 at the time that the act is passed, <coughs> to being there for, what, uh, 12 plus uh, 11 is 23. <laughs> when she finally gets out. And the three epigraphs, as soon as Gregory... You can take those later if you want. No, 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 this is really <laughs> illustrative, it's great. Because it has two, it has several writing through time things. One is that I completely didn't understand why I did this until the other day, when Gregory said writing through time and I started thinking about it. And it came to me as I was making notes. Um, another is that you know I did it when I did it so long ago, maybe I wasn't capable of, of understanding it directly. I could only do it intuitively. And here's the, the way it frames uh, time. Uh, let me read them first. So the first is from the Massachusetts Board of Health on the Nashua River proposal that created the, the Wachusett Reservoir, which did in fact flood some houses and mills. I don't know um, if any of you have seen the church. There's a, an empty church on the edge of the reservoir that's extremely picturesque, um, which I think, I can't tell, I, I mean, I don't have days and days to spend doing internet research. I think that was the first time they flooded towns to make a reservoir, possibly in the whole country. And it's, this is on, from their proposal in 1895. And it says, it does not appear to us to be a very important objection to our plan that certain mill sites will be 80 feet below the surface of the basin, nor that the homes of many industrious people dependent upon these mills for their living will also be submerged, because all these can be paid for and an equivalent will be given. And then the last one is, pretty much 100 years later, in 1994, uh, Ray Raposa, the director of the New England Water Works Association, said, in the course of talking about these projects, you don't impound water where people live anymore. 
So this is a waterworks guy saying, you just, it's not done, you just don't do it, it's over. And in between, I have a local politician from one of the towns, a selectman of Dana, Massachusetts, saying in 1922, and this, this uh, sentence has haunted me now for almost 20 years, we are the victims of an unfortunate necessity. And I realize that the reason these three epigraphs are here, and by the way, the book starts with uh, the three epigraphs, then a short prologue, then the part one page, then another epigraph, then two really short chapters, and then the first long chapter. My old agent said it was like someone trying to kickstart a cranky motorcycle. <laughs> Finally, it got going. Um, but what I understood about these epigraphs is that, so that, you know, the first one, basically they're creating the idea. They're saying, we could do this, it's no problem, we can pay for it, it's fine. The end, he's saying, it's over, we don't do that. It's a short time, it's only 100 years of human history, that's not much. But these people were in the bullseye. So that window of time happened to catch them. They were the ones who paid the price for this folly for 100 years of thinking that it was okay to do this. So I thought that was a very interesting comment. That and the fact that it took me all this time to understand why I had those three quotations. I really had no idea uh, what that was about. So why don't you read a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So see, take, a, take a look at the clock. And yeah, okay. Well, what I... leave time for questions. Yeah, right. Uh, what I chose here, uh, in keeping with writing through time, is I thought I would read some... The, the main, as I said, the narrative spine of the book is this character, Polly McPhee's diary entries. And there's a lot of other stuff around it. But I thought I would just read diary entries from... Um, for, for, from the early years, 27, 28, and then from the later years, uh, 36 and so on, because um, her voice changes a great deal, of course. And I think the revision I did really affected the end of the book a lot, and I think her voice became really a lot older because I was so much older and I understood so much more. So just a couple things to explain. Uh, there's a reference to Rebecca, that's Polly's real name. Polly is a nickname. There's a reference to peckers. They call the men who were the, the unskilled laborers who are hired to cut down all the trees where the reservoir is going to be woodpeckers. It was a derisive name for them among the valley inhabitants. Um, there's also a discussion of her selling her house. And what many people did is they sold their house to the commission and then rented it back for a nominal. Some, a lot of people did that. Uh, and there's a part about a church, and one's, this church was burned down. No one ever found out who did it. There was a lot of debate about whether it was a worker or a valley resident. Anyway, so here we go. Um, January 2nd, 1927. So here's Polly McPhee, 11 and 2 thirds years old, new diary, straight hair, pale eyes, weak smile. Too smart for her own good, too big for her britches. Reads more than she should. Got a wristwatch for Christmas exactly like she asked for, on condition of wearing it only to church until she's 13. Wants to have more friends, but doesn't know how to do it. Wants to not be called names. Sleeps with a big orange cat older than she is, feeds and brushes the dog. Treats her brother real nice most of the time. Washes her face and says her prayers every night without fail. I suppose it doesn't matter how I got here. Everybody gets somewhere somehow. Sometimes I'm surprised my parents had me, but then sometimes they are too. I know I catch them looking from me to Caleb, both of them, wondering what was the difference. But you can't expect life to give you reason, Pa tells us whenever he, gives a whenever he gets a chance. Events that happen now and then that make no sense at all. February 20th. They say this is the year. It's hard to believe, but that's what they say. Most think it was settled a long time ago. Though some still say we have a chance. Mr. Partridge scoffs at that. How do we stand up in Boston today, Mr. McPhee? He asked my daddy last week when we were getting us some mails. How do you think they like us up there on Beacon Hill? After we left, my father explained that at the meeting in Enfield, he and Mr. Partridge had had words. Mr. Partridge wanted to give up, he told me, 
and try to work the best deal, but he wasn't ready for that yet. It didn't matter whether there was a real good chance of winning, he said. Everyone would feel better if we fought it as long as we could. There's no question that most folks have come to believe it. It has certainly changed the town. A few families we know have already left. Business is closed up. It's a long way off if it happens at all, but some people act fast. I suppose facts are facts. They filed the bill last month and it'll pass, everyone says, just like the one before it. I heard they already bought some land. March 19th. Last night we saw a man from the commission. He was small and harmless looking, but Pa says he's the main engineer. We were coming out of the inn and he walked right past us on the sidewalk, followed by a whole mob as if he were president or something. That bastard used to fish here, Pa said after they'd gone by. He used to eat our goddamn trout. Then he apologized for his language. You'd think he'd be more careful. As it is, I'm tempted to cross out these words now that I've written them down. April 16th. Can't find the dog. I've looked everywhere. My heart is broken. Caleb seems to care for once and has tried to give me comfort. He claims the dog will come back, but it's three whole days old now and I'm starting to not believe it. He isn't the sort who goes away for long stretches. In fact, he comes in every night. He prefers to stay by me. I know Ma is glad, though she pretends not to be. She never liked him for some reason, nor he her. They, never, they just never got along. She tells me we'll get another, but I really dislike her for, for her to give up on him like that. And I want my old dog back. She has never said a bad word about that dog. Not a one. Just gone on hating him as well. <laughs> I went out looking today. Of course it did me no good. I can't stand to think about what might have happened to him, so I'll assume he's coming back. April 22nd. The dog is gone. There isn't any question. If he were alive within five miles, he would have found his way back. I know he loves me, so he must be dead. April 27th. Ma says they finally decided. The bill was passed and the governor signed. Pa is out in the yard kicking dirt. Ma says we have to leave our homes, every one of us. It's finally true. October 9th. Indian summer, it's called, and I can't imagine why. I'm sure they like the warm October, but of course, so do we. In the orchard this morning, I was looking for drops, and a breeze blew, soft and warm. Indian summer, I thought. I straightened up slowly, and then took off my jacket, stretched out my arms. The breeze flowed all around and brought faraway places. Greece and China, Timbuktu, places I will never see. There were Indians here once, and they felt those breezes too, waited for them every year. Some Nipmuc girl, same as me, was standing in that spot with her arms held out wide about a thousand years ago, stopped in what she was doing, surprised the air was so warm, wondering about the wind, what would she would have for dinner that night, when she would see the first snow. And before her were the trees and the rabbits and deer and the chipmunks and the otters in the East Branch, forever and ever all of them here before we came. But all those nipmuck are gone, and soon the rest of us too. Gone, long gone. The orchard, the hen house, the pasture, long gone. The otters and the chipmunks and the maples. Once it's done, we're long gone. Just the fishes and the turtles where Rebecca used to be. And now we move to May 1st, 1935. No, I'll go to May 26, 1935. A man from the commission came to see me today. I wonder what kept him. It's been six months already. Perhaps they've had their hands full. He was patient and respectful, certainly, and very proper, too, at first, although he couldn't help smiling. It's about time this was done, he said, as he opened up his case and took out a contract. It's just a question of the figures, is all, of our reaching an agreement. I had done a little checking with the neighbors and in town, so had in mind a minimum price. You can imagine my surprise when the figure he named was substantially higher, and my further astonishment when I found myself asking for more than that, and he readily assented. It would give Pa satisfaction, I thought, 
watching the man write the numbers into the blanks, but then I wondered if it would. I served him tea and cookies, and we talked about the details. He was trying to take his time. He really was very cheerful, considering his errand. He knew I didn't have a choice. Just business, he kept saying, and I think he believed it. He may even have been right. Still, the pen felt very cold as I held it in my hand, and my signature, once down, was stark and black and unforgiving, hardly Polly's at all. To Enfield this October 8th, 1936. To Enfield this afternoon to sell my squash. After stopping at the library, I went right by the church, or I should say the place it was. Even after all the destruction I've seen, the demolitions and transportations, it was something of a blow. I had to stop and get out and wander around for a while, convincing myself that what I saw was true and real. The church had been there forever. It was Enfield, more or less, and I had a miserable time accepting it as gone. All the more so I'm certain because of what still stood around it. Its sorry ex-location was so clearly defined. Any idiot could see that a church had disappeared, never mind a former congregant, never mind me. But here is one consolation. When they've torn down the rest, it'll all be bare soil, just dust and stone, and the marking of past presences will be an academic problem, very dry, without pain. Sad to think, but surely so. There comes a point at which enough has been taken that what's left begs for removal, cries out to join the departed. And feels not there yet, but as I stared at the naked ground, the looted graveyard, I could see the day coming, the day on which we'll join together to pull what, down what remains, to return it all, for God's sake, to primordial mud. As I studied the vacancy, it brought to mind others. All the empty places everywhere, across the county and the commonwealth, the breadth of the nation. Roy's rented room, for example, the spot on his bureau in which my portrait once stood. Mama's place at our table. The shelf in New York that held Caleb's books and souvenir, if it still exists at all. The Danby's lot and the empty graves and all the falling down shacks of all the farmers who fled their dust fields for the coast. The little chair in the White House in which the Lincoln boy once sat. That stinking barn and the children missing fathers in the war and your naked smeary plate when you finished your pie. I was so solemnly aware of all the hollowness around me of how it overwhelms the fullness, how all our frantic industry is mere vapor to its wind, that I wrap my arms about myself and close tight my eyes and march quickly to the auto without ever looking back. Uh, April 19th, 1937. April 9th, 1937. Damn it, I didn't get enough for that syrup, nor put up nearly enough lazy slugger that I had. And I think I'm so smart. If I'd worked harder and asked top dollar, I could have doubled the take from Sandberg and still kept some for the tourists. As it is, I'll hear them asking, don't you have any syrup? The entire blessed spring. It's all gone, I will tell them, and they'll come back with just the candy, no syrup, and I'll be hard pressed not to shriek. It's all gone, I'll say again, but I've got some nice honey. And they'll look at me and wait. If you could walk through the tunnel, this is the main tunnel that's drawing water out of the Quabbin, which is near Polly's house, April 12th. If you could walk through the tunnel from the other direction, you might come out the western end to find a different sort of valley, a valley cast back in time, before they started the project, before white people arrived, before Miss Polly came of age and grew so weathered and wise. When I was nine or 10 years old, I ran across the word pristine and thought of the most beautiful idea in the world, once I looked it up, of course. I'm sure that my own life was in some way pristine a very long time ago, but now that doesn't apply to me nor anything around. We've all been touched by human hands. So maybe I'll drive out to Coldbrook tomorrow and sneak down their shaft and walk the dock until I'm home. Maybe I'll arrive before the Indians if I'm lucky and have the whole place to myself. April 14th, today's anniversary, the death of the Titanic, exactly 25 years. What I can't seem to shake is the thought of the fathers. They knew for sure some of them did, but there could be no saying. How hideous and low, what a fate. 
Some little girl was six then, and she's 31 now, and every time she hears a certain word, father or deck or voyage, or perhaps the phrase, take care, she remembers his embrace and his reassuring tones and his wave as they lower the boat into the sea, and she feels to this day the urge to rise up on her feet and climb the side of the ship to get back to him back, make him come along too. April 22nd. I sold the cow, faithful Clara, to people who need her more than I do, which is little if at all. Still, I'm sad. April 27th. Talk about famous disasters. They're gone now, the peckers, gone at last. But you should see what they did to our valley. Mm -hmm. I got through that without embarrassing myself. That's good. Well, I'm going to read a, a short section which has nothing to do with anything that Bob has written about. And in, indeed, it's kind of an embarrassment to, at this point, to hinge, uh, to hinge the stories together. But if I, could, if I could lunge inappropriately for some sort of connection, I would again go back to the business of time and to uh, Polly's walking, imagining walking through the valley and coming out to some other time, some other time more pristine, before the sorrows that she is dealing with actually um, come to bite her. And the section I'm going to read from Egg and Spoon, uh, I, I pick pretty much at random, but it's about another kind of solace. It's not the solace of history and the imagination, it's the solace of storytelling. To set this up, uh, there is the witch, Baba Yaga, and her house that stands on two giant chicken legs, which happens uh, in this scene to be sitting on the back of a flatbed train car. Uh, and, and on its way to St. Petersburg. In the house is Baba Yaga the witch and a talking cat and a girl named Cat, who is not a cat, she's a girl. Uh, she's actually a rather wealthy girl. Uh, Baba Yaga's house is invisible to adults, so mostly they have been safe, but this particular day, the train has stopped uh, in the middle of the day. Usually it travels at night, but it's stopped in the middle of the day, and Baba Yaga's afraid that local school children might be able to see the house because children can see the witch's house. The cargo train was pulling to a stop in a small town. It was the first time they'd entered a station during the daylight. I hope your house isn't discovered, said Cat. What would they do to you? I told you, the house is invisible to adults, said the witch. That's why we've had no trouble with the crew of the train. But bad cess upon us, it is visible to children. With any luck, the local children are languishing in a schoolroom or some other prison. <laughs> With any luck, I thought you didn't have luck, the kitten taunted Baba Yaga, only destiny. Such proved to be true, for by the time the train came to a halt, first three, then seven, then ten, then eighteen children began to surge toward the windows of the house with their caps in their hands. One Palushka, one Denga, one Kopeck, any coin of any size, cried the children. <laughs> oh, the peskiness of brute childhood. I always detested it, remarked the witch. Nonsense, said the kitten. You ate children for a living and loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but by invitation only. A mob is an ugly thing. And the younger, the uglier. What do they want, asked Cat. Kopex yelled the children. Money for food and food. We want food. Who doesn't? The witch hollered at them. We don't have a morsel. Go away. But the children didn't. They could see the house, and they loved the look of it. As Cat craned farther, she could tell that the house was sitting with its two big chicken legs stuck out, like the stiff legs of a porcelain doll coming <laughs> straight off a shelf. The children were reaching up to grab onto the legs and swing on them. The house was ticklish and shivered its timbers. <laughs> you better do something, said the kitten, or your house is going to collapse on its back, and then you'll have to find rooms in this village and live here. This is outrageous. I have never been under such an assault. Even when Bajazé and Roxanne came for dinner and trashed the place. If worst comes to worst, I'll move to the Bronx and spend afternoons playing bingo in some church hall, cheating like the other old hens. <laughs> Stop that at once, she screamed again. Urchins have no manners. <laughs> the house was rocking back and forth in mirth. The table fell off the sideboard. Dum-dum! 
If you don't settle down, I'll give those hoidens some giant barbecued chicken legs for supper, <laughs> bellowed the witch. Give them something, said Cat. Attention, anything. Oh, is that all it takes? <laughs> the witch used a soupy voice. So glad I have a high-level security advisor on board. <laughs> Still, she changed her tone when she returned to the window. Children, your old babushka doesn't have two coins to call her own. Give us gold ingots then, shouted some wag. <laughs> and the other children laughed. I'll give you what for, muttered the witch. Then, oh, Granny Greasy Hair doesn't have a smidgen for you, much less a side of beef. Milk and bread, they chorused. Not a chance. Would you like me to sing you a song instead? The response was deafening. No! <laughs> they were beginning to climb the house's legs to make children climb apple trees. We'll be overrun by the verb in any moment, hissed the witch. We're lost. Tell her the story, said Cat. You tell her the story. I'm busy, she snapped. She meant to sit in her rocking chair and suck her thumb. <laughs> the kitten was pretending to forgive the table. Well, that's a side plot. Cat leaned out the window. My babushka's going to have her afternoon nap, she said. You must be quiet or she'll wake up and eat you all. The children screamed with joy and fake terror. This is intolerable, muttered the witch. I've lost all credibility. <laughs> I'll tell you a story, why not, said Cat. Better be a good one, shouted the little girl. It's the best, said Cat. She searched in her mind for legends from the elegant storybook that her great aunt had given her. She settled on the wonder tale of Sar Sultan. She began to tell about the three beautiful sisters and how the youngest one married the Tsar, but all her children were kidnapped by Baba Yaga and hidden in a chamber under a tree. Slander, actionable offense, muttered the witch from behind Cat. Outside, the hungry children had quieted down. What next, they asked. So Cat continued about how the Tsar eventually threw his young bride into the sea in a casket made of wood, which floated away to a magic island. Now that was foolish, muttered the witch. The casket ought to have been made of stone so it could sink. Like a stone. <laughs> there was a magic squirrel, it seemed, who cracked nuts of gold with his teeth, and a cat who lived in a magic crystal mansion. A distant relative, I think, mewed the kitten. Magic cat! And squirrels, ha! And, and magic ladles, no doubt, hissed the wish. And, and, and magic button hooks. Oh, and a magic telegraph pole. And magic, um, um, musk melons. And enchanted piles of donkey manure. Very magic. She was having fun pretending not to listen. <laughs> Cat paid her no mind. She told the tale as well as she could recall it. Catastrophe followed catastrophe, but eventually the Tsar was reunited with the young bride he had tried to murder, and their marriage resumed with peals of delight. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder they call these fairy tales, said the witch. Tolstoy would know better, and a fast train coming into a station would be involved. Blood, tears, regret, all the fun stuff. But the children seemed satisfied. They might have preferred a basket full of dinner rolls or a fistful of rubies. But the story would see them through the coming night until the morning brought new promise. The story fed one hunger anyway. And really, thought Cat, how much more can we reasonably ask than that? <laughs> Group. And we, now we have uh, we have ten or twelve minutes for questions uh, from the audience about uh, the process of writing, about writing through time, about Swift River and the history of Massachusetts, um, about Russian fairy tales. <laughs> it, it, it does kind of cover the waterfront here, let's face it. But, uh, but we're we're eager to hear anything that anybody uh, is curious to ask about. Was Greenwich a real town, or is it? Greenwich, a yes, the grounds to Greenwich. Yes, there were four towns, Greenwich, Prescott, Enfield, and Dana. Dana wasn't actually in the act, or most of it was left out, but they quickly realized that they would be, the people who lived in Dana Center, that they would be terribly isolated, and that all their sources of income would be gone, because all the mills that were down by the river were being flooded. So they voluntarily threw in with everyone else. So is it based on fact? It is, it is based on fact. Um, uh, I think.
think I'll just read you from briefly I said in the afterword. Um, the history of Massachusetts' Swift River Valley and the Quabbin Reservoir as portrayed here is unfortunately all too real. I believe this portrayal will be generally accurate, although accounts differ, and as a novelist, I have not hesitated to shift a date or alter a minor fact when it suited my story. But of course, the characters are completely made up. Question over here. Oh, I was, I was going to say this topic has always fascinated me, and I was wondering what inspired you to write about this. Uh, I, I always have had an affinity for hidden suffering. So I wrote a book about that's set during the Japanese invasion of, invasion of China in the 30s, which certainly wasn't hidden if you were Japanese or Chinese, but most Americans know, knew very little about it. For Americans, you know, the war started with the war in Europe, and particularly the rape of Nanking, which some of you may have heard of, which is a terrible terrible event, and, but, but by the time I first started working on that book, almost no one knew about it. So, I don't know, there's some satisfaction in unearthing suffering and exposing it to people. <laughs> You're so kind. <laughs> and, and I guess that's a writing through time thing, too, because it would be impossible to appreciate then what we can appreciate now, simply because of the passing of time. I mean, that would be true about someone in 1814 looking back at something that happened in 1737 or 1725, right? I mean, you can't understand some things until time has gone by. There's another question over here. I just wanted to know, do you do most of your research through interviewing people who went through it or through I, articles? I, yeah, I, I hung out a lot with the, they're almost almost all gone now, sadly, at least people who are old enough to remember having a home in the valley and leaving, because really you'd have to be, have been born in 25, and so now it's getting into their 90s. And, but um, a wonderful woman called Lois Doubleday Barnes that I talked to a lot, sadly died two years ago. It was my dream that she would read this book one day, and she didn't make it. Um, but yes, I did talk to a lot of people. I went to the Swift River Valley Historical Society. Let me put in a plug in New Salem, which is a beautiful town. And I think, although Peterson is also lovely, New Salem, I think, is as close as you could ever get to seeing what the Swift River Valley towns looked like before they were flooded. It's lovely. And the, the Historical Society is fascinating. I hung out there. I went there like probably four times. And there was a great exhibition at the Commonwealth Archives over at um, uh, Columbia Point, and uh, yeah. I have two questions for Bob, and you ha you have one, and then then let's uh, let's move to book signing, uh, if that's okay. Why don't you go first, sir? Yeah, um, the Great Depression was right smack in the middle of this time frame, so um, did that like extend the project, or uh, people didn't get as much money for their houses? Or? Uh, actually. Um, you know, this was a really high priority problem. I mean, Boston was this close several times to really running out of water. And uh, <clears throat> this was, once the proposal was really in place, kind of so obviously a good thing. And in fact, I don't, I'm not a historian of civil engineering products, projects. It has to be one of the most efficient and cost effective civil engineering products in history. We've all, we're all drinking the water. Well, I live in Cambridge, so I don't. <laughs> I flush the toilet with it, and the rest of it. Uh, we're all drinking the water since 1946. And it costs some, I don't know what, $50 million in, in, in money back then. And it's all these millions of people every day going to the tap and getting this water. Um, so uh, I don't think they had any trouble. I think they had the resources committed by the state. And the labor, of course, was very cheap, right? So here's my penultimate question, which is, you said that Polly changed from the time that you wrote the book 17 years ago, was it? And, and, and now, and, and the book has published. Can you, it, it, Polly changed at the end. It, and can you, is there any way you can, 
characterize that in a way we would understand? It sounds kind of trite to say it, but uh, I was more sympathetic to the younger Polly when I was younger. <laughs> I mean, I was, whatever, uh, 38. Um, and she was 12 or 13, 14. And more sympathetic to the older one when I was older, but also, I would say that uh, the book is about loss, and the reservoir isn't the only bad thing that happens to Paul. It's the kind of stuff that goes on too. And it's about recognizing the inevitability of loss and you know, the fact that you can, you can kind of categorize losses, but then also there's just this big concept called loss, and it all goes in there. And, you know, once you're in your 50s and people have died, you know, that you love, and uh, various things have happened, uh, you understand that a lot better. So, I don't even think I really got it that, well, anyway, Polly's, the losses, the particular losses, and the erasure of the valley, I did think early when I was writing the book, I thought, you know, if they hadn't been flooded and you were 80 years old and you went back, you'd hate it anyway, right? There'd be McDonald's <laughs> everywhere, and it wouldn't look the same, and they'd have torn down your favorite tree and built a subdivision in Smith's pasture, and so on. But I didn't really understand about what loss through time means until I was older, so. <laughs> well, my last question is, uh, and, and one of the reasons that writing through time struck me as a good, as a good way to consider uh, this book, and, and, uh, and I guess Boone a little bit too, and that is that um, you, 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 you introduced it by talking about having written it, having a hard time getting it published, setting it aside, but now it is published. And so I'm, I'm curious, uh, I'm going to take psychological notes. Um, what are you working on next? I mean, because now something has happened to you. Well, and I'm wondering. See, this is one way in which I'm a lot you. smarter. Um, <laughs> when I was younger, I would have thought, "Oh my God!" Now I published this book. Everyone knows I'm back in the writing game again. I got to write another novel. Well, I'm just going to do whatever happens. I have a job. You know, and I need to keep it. <laughs> Badly need to keep it if I ever, ever have any hope of retiring. Um, and I have unpublished books, which undoubtedly will also benefit from being looked at again. And I would have thought, you know, this is really an interesting writing through time thing, Gregory, because I might have thought 10 years ago that that was a ridiculous idea. Like, they wrote, you wrote them, they're a, they're a product of the time, mm -hmm. but it worked in this case. Yeah. This finally became the book that I wanted it to be. So I may go back to those. My most well-known book, Tree of Heaven, I'm going to try to get that up on Create Space too, yeah. and start selling it. I have the rights. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm not worrying about it. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's a good place to be, to be in a place of not worrying. <laughs> you know, sometimes it takes a lot of time to get to that place. I really, I, I stopped writing because of all the rejection. And I was punishing. And finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. And some other bad stuff was happening in my life. And I just said, that's it. It's over. And once it really penetrated my brain that I could publish a book now without having to go back to those people, you know, and has to be judged again and be rejected again. And let me tell you, it's a, such a wonderful feeling. It's so great. I, someone said, someone said, are you looking at sales figures? And I said, no, 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 I'm just enjoying it. I don't care about that stuff. It can be bought. That's all I care about. Well, now, it can be bought, and indeed can be bought right through that door. <laughs> and, and also, uh, there are uh, some of my books, and there are a couple of copies of Jill's The Late Scholar, which is new this season, getting very good reviews. If you're interested in murder mysteries set in England in the 1950s, starring Lord Peter Whimsey and Harry Vane. So, thank you all for coming, and we'll, we'll enjoy the